and take a seat, and as you're doing so, take your Bibles and turn to Luke chapter 16. Your Bibles, your apps, whatever you read on. Uh, if you don't have a Bible or, or you just don't have a Bible with you, uh, there are Bibles underneath some of the chairs. Grab one of those and turn there. Uh, if you don't have a Bible at home, grab that Bible under the chair at the end of the service, tuck it under your arm, and walk out the door with it. We want every person to have a Bible in their house that, where they can go and they can study, they can see God's face through His Word. So feel free to take one of those Bibles with you if you don't have one. Uh, that is our gift to you. Now, uh, I, I'm sorry for the lights if they're a little bright. I'm hoping that the reflection off of my head is not too intense. Uh, if it's offensive, put your sunglasses on. You're not going to offend me at all. Don't worry about it. Um, so, But yeah, we're trying to get things figured out, but... The great thing about technology is it's awesome. The thing that's horrible about technology is when it goes bad, it goes bad. So uh, uh, sorry about that. Uh, my senior year of high school, uh, I used to drive a 1974 GMC pickup with a 454 engine in it. Uh, those of you who know engines or cars, that thing guzzled gas like nobody's business. I mean, I could, on a good day, I got five miles to the gallon. Uh, you car guys know exactly what I mean. This was the model pickup that they had two gas tanks built onto the vehicle because you couldn't get 30 minutes down the highway without running out of a full tank of gas. Um, so, big truck. Uh, and, and my senior year, I was you know, finishing up high school and looking at going to college, and my parents went, Chad, uh, O.C., you're, this is not a good vehicle to drive back and forth between here and college, wherever you're going to go to school. So let's find you something a little more fuel efficient, which was great because my dad's buddy had a 1992 cherry red Ford Mustang for sale. Yeah. Yeah. And so my dad and his buddy and I, we got together and we bought that 1992 cherry red Ford Mustang. And that was the vehicle that I took to college. And I loved that car. It was, it was a Mustang. I, do I need to say more? I mean, it was great. And so uh, it, my junior year of college, uh, it was the 4th of July, and a, me and a bunch of our friends decided we'd drive into the city and go see the fireworks show in town. So we loaded up in the Mustang. We drove into town. Fireworks show was amazing. We had a great time that night. We drove back home uh, after the show to our little town, little college town that we all lived in. Dropped everybody off and then walked my girlfriend, not my current wife, never mind, walked my girlfriend to her front door, gave her a kiss on the cheek, and walked back out to the parking lot where my 1992 cherry red Ford Mustang was sitting came around the corner of her building and the parking lot opens up to see smoke billowing out the driver's side window of my Mustang. So I hauled over to where my Mustang was at, flew the door open, and the instrument panel of my Mustang was on fire. And so I ran back to my girlfriend's apartment because I did not have a fire extinguisher in my vehicle. Side note, put a fire extinguisher in your vehicle. Went into my girlfriend's apartment screaming and yelling that I needed water, I need water. And so grabbed as many pitchers and glasses of water as I could haul, ran down, started throwing water on it, and it didn't work. The fire was not going out. It was continuing to burn. We tried and tried. My girlfriend called 911 when we came to a point where we were like, well, we're not winning at this. We need to just wait uh, on the fire department now. And so I came to terms with the fact that my 1992 cherry red Ford Mustang was dying, and I went and sat on the curb in the parking lot and watched it burn. And as I'm sitting there, my girlfriend pacing behind me like this, trying to figure out how to respond because her boyfriend's car is burning in the parking lot, and... <clears throat> As we're standing there, sitting there, um, all of a sudden we hear, vroom, my Mustang started. The ignition wires in the steering column had melted together and the car started in the parking lot with no one in it as it burned. You laugh, it wasn't your 1992 Cherry Red Ford Mustang. This was a devastating point in my life. Uh, it, it did give a little bit of levity to the circumstance because I was like, oh, can my car, my car started. <laughs> and so I sat there on the curb as my car burned. Fire department showed up, 
put the fire out. It ended up being a recall issue that came up years later, and I didn't get any benefits out of it. Anyways, so that's not even the point of the story. The point of the story is a week later, I was trying to figure out what to do now. I had a job in the city, uh, and it was about 20, 25-minute drive from where I lived. I had no way to get there because I didn't have a car. If I lost my job, I had no way to save up money to get a new car, and it was a pretty bad situation for me. And a buddy of mine said, hey man, I know you need a vehicle right now. I've got this old junker Jeep Wagoneer that I've been rebuilding into a rock climber. You want to borrow it? I said, yes, please. And so he let me borrow this old Jeep Wrangler uh, so that I could get back and forth to work. In a month and a half, two months, I saved up enough money, was able to put a down payment on a, uh, another used vehicle, and everything worked out great. But Would I have been able to save up money, go to work, and all those things had my friend not loaned me his car? Absolutely not. How many of you have ever been saved (laughs) by a friend, somebody who helped you out in a moment of need? It's it's a big deal. It's something that uh, I hope that I would do for others. I hope somebody would do for me if they were uh, if I was struggling. You know, it's something that we as good humans hopefully would do for one another. And today's passage actually talks about this a little bit, but not from the viewpoint of person to person, but from us to God and how God blesses us with things. And so let's look at this passage. Luke 16, we're going to start in verse 1. Luke 16, starting in verse 1, it says this. Jesus is talking. He says, He also said to the disciples, There was a rich man who had a manager. And charges were brought to him that this man was wasting his possessions. And he called him and said to him, What is this that I hear about you? Turn in the account of your management, for you can no longer be manager. And the manager said to himself, What shall I do since my master is taking the management away from me? I'm not strong enough to dig, and I'm ashamed to beg. I have decided what to do, so that when I am removed from management, people may receive me into their houses." So, summoning his master's debtors one by one, he said to the first, How much do you owe my master? And he said, A hundred measures of oil. And he said, Take your bill, sit down quickly, and write fifty. Then he said to another, How much do you owe? And he said, A hundred measures of wheat. And he said to him, Take your bill and write eighty. And the master commended the dishonest manager for his shrewdness. For the sons of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons of light. And I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of unrighteous wealth, so that when it fails, they may receive you into the eternal dwellings. One who is faithful in very little is also faithful in much, and one who is dishonest in very little is also dishonest in much." If then you have not been faithful in unrighteous wealth, who will entrust you with true riches? And if you have not been faithful in that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Interesting passage. As a matter of fact, let me just call out the white elephant in the room. This is a different parable. This is a different parable. Because in most parables, it's pretty easy to distinguish at least who the characters are supposed to uh, symbolize or illustrate. Oh, well, this character is supposed to be God, and and this person is supposed to be this kind of follower, and this person... It's usually kind of easy to at least distinguish that, but... This parable, it's not that easy. Uh, There are a lot of things about this parable that are kind of confusing to us. So let me, before we get into what Jesus is trying to teach us, let's get through the muddiness of this passage, of this parable, and let me clarify some issues for you. First off, most parables deal with one of two issues. It either deals with salvation in the kingdom of God, uh, or it deals with why Jesus calls us to follow him, okay? Okay. Um, this passage deals with neither one. It's not about the kingdom of God necessarily. Uh, It's not necessarily about morality. This passage is about how we handle God's blessings. 
So that's the first thing out of the way. The second thing is the characters are a little difficult to distinguish because most of the time when we have a parable that talks about a master, the master is symbolizing God, correct? It's equating to God the Father. When it's a father or a master, it's, it's meaning God. But in this parable, the master actually commends the manager for being dishonest. Now, does God ever commend us or cheer us on when we're dishonest? No. So, guys, this parable is not giving us permission to be dishonest or to swindle people or anything like that. So, just get that out in the open. Don't interpret this parable to say, oh, well, God wants me to be a dishonest person and cheat people out of their money. No, that's not what it means. Not at all. Okay, the third thing here is there are, there are two phrases or words that are used in this passage that are kind of difficult for us as Americans. The first one being, in verses 9 and 11, it talks about unrighteous wealth. Now, I'm not going to explain this one yet, because it actually impacts the sermon later on. So, keep that in mind. There's this idea of unrighteous wealth and what it is. I'll explain it later. The second term or word used here that's a little bit difficult for us as Americans is the word shrewd or shrewdness. It's used in verse 8, um, and I don't know about you, but when I grew up, uh, as I grew up, my understanding of the word shrewd was to mean someone who was clever, but they used their cleverness in a negative or selfish way. Does that make, make sense? So when somebody, when I heard somebody being described as being shrewd, I thought, oh, well, maybe they're a good business person, but it's not something that a follower of Christ would want to be, because maybe they're being dishonest in the way they, they're using their resources to get their own, to get more resources, or maybe they're taking advantage of people or something like that. That's not what the Bible means here. So let me give you first off, Merriam-Webster's definition of shrewd, it means having or showing an ability to understand things and make good judgments. So no matter how you grew up, maybe you didn't grow up with the, uh, the understanding of the word shrewd the way I did, no matter how you grew up, the actual definition of being shrewd is a good thing. Having or knowing something, having the ability to look at a situation and make wise decisions based off of what you observe. So it's a good thing. Now, this passage, Luke, Luke was the writer of the book of Luke. That's why it's named Luke. Luke wrote this book, and when he wrote it, he wrote it in the language of the Greeks. He wrote it in the Greek language. The Greek word, I'm not going to get into what it's called and all that stuff, but I want you to understand the Greek word for shrewd actually means similar to the same thing. It's not a negative word. It's, it's a word that just simply means he was able to look at his circumstances and make wise decisions. This word is used also in the parable of the ten virgin, virgins. Uh, that parable is where ten virgins uh, are waiting for the, groom, the bridegroom to come. Uh, they wait. They save their oil. They don't light their lamps because they're going to wait. Um, and so because they saved their oil and they made a wise decision to save that oil... They are named, they are called being shrewd, which is a good thing. Uh, that parable is actually about us making wise decisions about the Lord. So, shrewd is a good thing, no matter what your understanding of that word is. Now, we've got all the muddy, we've got most of the, we've got some of the muddy water cleared up, okay? So, let's actually get into what Jesus is trying to teach us here. Because that's the whole point of me standing up here. I can give you definitions, but it doesn't do any good when you walk out these doors. So here's what's, what Jesus is trying to teach us in this parable. And it's simply this. Your stuff is not your stuff. It's God's stuff. Your stuff is not your stuff. It's His stuff. Okay? So let me kind of explain this a little bit. Jesus has given all of us many forms of resources, whether it be money or a house or a car or cars or a job or a physically strong body or a really mentally strong mind or being emotionally mature or having great relationships. or You see how I can go on and on with the way God has blessed each and every one of us? Guys, you could be poor as poor and have faith that could move mountains, and that faith is going to 
be more valuable to you than any amount of money. Uh, So God blesses each and every one of us in different ways, but every blessing that you have in your life, you don't have any power over. You didn't have the ability. You in and of yourself did not give you that resource. So let me explain this to you, because some of you are going, well, I disagree because I made the money by sweat and tears of my hands and blah, blah, blah. But guys, who created you? God. You didn't create yourself. You didn't go, huh, here I am. That's not how it works. Do you have any ability to provide yourself the air that you're breathing day in and day out for the rest of your life? God provides the air you breathe. Your heart is beating because God allows it to beat. Let me go a step further. Your ability to learn how to do a job, God gave that to you. So if God gave you the ability and the talents to be able to work, he gave you the physical body and the mental strength to be able to do a job, then therefore, the money you make from doing the job that God gave you the ability to be able to perform, that doesn't belong to you, it belongs to him. Everything you own belongs to God, including your family. You can... Try and have babies all you want, but if God doesn't ordain it, if God doesn't want it to happen, it's not going to happen. Your children belong to God. Your parents belong to God. He's the one who created them. Your friendships belong to God. Everything you have is God's. If you want biblical proof of this, go back into Psalm 24, Job chapter 1, um, Deuteronomy 18, uh, or 8, I mean, 1 Corinthians 4, 1 Corinthians 10. All of those passages talk about everything on the face of the world belongs to God. Even your ability to do your job belongs to Him, which means your money that you make from that job belongs to Him. So your stuff is not your stuff, it's His stuff. Did I say stuff enough? Okay, just making sure, because I can say that one more time. Your stuff is not your stuff, it's his stuff. The fact is, is we need to change our approach and our attitude towards our stuff. So let me put it in an illustration for you, okay? My opening illustration or story was about how somebody really bailed me out by loaning me a car, right? So let's say your car breaks down, and you go... You come to me and say, hey, Pastor O.C., I heard you have an extra car, which, by the way, I don't, so don't come asking. Um, And let's say you come to me and say, hey, I hear you've got an extra car. Can I borrow your car for a few weeks so that I can continue to go to work and save enough money to go get me a new car? And and I look at you and I say, yeah, but I have some stipulations. I've got some boundaries that I'm going to put on you borrowing this car. First off, I want you to take care of it. Is that an unreasonable request from someone who is loaning you a $15,000, in my case, a $3,000, a $1,500 car? Is that an unreasonable request for me to make of you? Take care of what I'm loaning you. Is that unreasonable in any way? No. What if I also look to you and I say, and I have someone else who has come to me in need. They need a ride twice a week to their job. It actually fits in your time schedule quite nicely. I want you to take the vehicle that I've loaned you and go pick this person up and take them to their, work, to their work twice a week. And it works perfectly in your time schedule. Is that an unreasonable request? Absolutely not. It's my stuff. It's my car. And if you want to borrow it, you borrow it under my requirements. Your stuff is not your stuff, it's his stuff. And so the fact is, is he puts requirements on his stuff. We're managers, we're not owners of anything. We're managers of his things, of his stuff. Look at verses 10 through 13 again with me. It says, one who is faithful in very little is also faithful in much, and one who is dishonest in very little is also dishonest in much. If then you have not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth, who will entrust you the true riches? And if you have not been faithful in that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. 
This is talking about God entrusting us with little things and big things. When it talks about this, it's talking about us. And so if everything is God's, if your stuff is not your stuff, it's his stuff. If that's true, then what does Jesus want us to do with his stuff? Well, this passage, this parable, in the, from the second half of verse 8 through all the way through 9, says this, use my stuff to bring people to Christ. Use my stuff to bring people to Christ. That's what he asks us to do. He asks us to use our influence, use our friendships, use our money, our car, our house, everything that we have, our family, our friendships, our job, everything is to be used to bring people to Christ. Even our spare time is to be used to bring people to Christ. And so how do we do that? Because there's a mention here of true riches. And the true riches are people. Because let me ask you something. I have a six-year-old son at home. I love this kid. Uh, he's a mess and a half, but I love this kid. And, and let me ask you something. If I die and I go to heaven, and, and when I get to heaven, I realize that all the money I had acquired and all the possessions I had acquired and all the free time and fun that I had, um, I got to go to heaven, but because I was more focused on my things and my time, that I didn't bring my son to come to know Christ, and I get to heaven, and my son doesn't go with me. What am I going to, what's more valuable there? Was it the things I had and the spare time I had, or was it the relationship with that person, with my son? The fact is, is, guys, you don't take anything you have on this planet, you don't take any of it with you. You don't. You don't take anything with you. All your money, all your possessions, all the fun you got to have, that doesn't make any difference if you don't lead people to Jesus. Because relationships and people are the true riches. So let me put it to you this way. If I told you, if I came to you and said, listen, if you'll live in a cardboard box through monsoon season for two weeks, I'll give you $20 million dollars. Would you live in a cardboard box during monsoon season for two weeks for $20 million? If you say no, you're an idiot. <laughs> That's an easy offer. But guys, let's be real here. How much, the average lifespan in America, depending on who you talk to, is somewhere between 77 and 82 years old. If you lived even past that, let's say you lived to 120, how much is 120 compared to forever? It's a grain of sand on all the beaches on the face of the earth. It's nothing. But we put so much value on that 120 years, and we throw away the forever. The fact is, guys, is we need to reevaluate how we look at God's blessings. All of it. He wants us to use his blessings for others. So how do we do that? Simply this. First off, we use his resources wisely. Guys, the Bible gives instruction to us on how to manage relationships, what's healthy and what's unhealthy, and gives us uh, ideas and recommendations and commands about how to handle relationships. The Bible is clear on how to manage our money. It gives us wise counsel about not getting in debt and how to avoid getting yourself in trouble financially. Follow that wise advice. The Bible gives us wise advice about how to think and what to dwell on and how to keep our mind healthy. The Bible even gives us pretty good instruction on how to stay physically healthy. So use God's resources with his instructions. Use your resources wisely through the instructions that he's given us in his word. And the second thing that we can do to use our resources to influence people to Christ is by simply being generous. It's being generous. Uh, guys, yesterday morning, I was sitting on the couch in my University of Texas t-shirt watching University of Texas versus Oklahoma. It was a horrible game. But... If somebody had called me yesterday morning during that game that I was kind of semi-sort of enjoying because they were losing, um, 
if somebody called me and said, Chad, we've got a crisis, we need your help, please come to our house, blah, 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 I'm not going to lie to you here. I'm enjoying my free time by watching something that I'm enjoying. I would probably have a conversation in my mind of, well, I don't want to go. I'm enjoying this right now. I'm having fun sitting with my son watching this football game. I don't want to do this. Don't judge me. You would all have that conversation in your mind too. Don't lie. The fact is, is is my free time, does it belong to me? Did God give me the ability to have that slate of time on Saturday morning? Yes, that's God's. And if somebody request that time because they have a need, then I should be generous with that and give that to them if I have the ability to. If I had thousands of dollars sitting in my checking account, which I don't, uh, (laughs) if I had lots of money or I had resources that somebody could be blessed through, then I would try and find a way to bless them through generosity. So we're called to use God's resources wisely and we're called to be generous with our time, with our family, with our resources, whatever it is. Just be generous. That's what Christ is calling us to do here. How we use God's resources is important, and here's why. This life is a test. It's only a test. This life is a test. It's only a test. You've heard the Public service announcement on the radio, this is a test of the emergency, blah, 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 blah. It's only a test. This life is a test. And I say it's only a test, but let me rephrase that. It's the only test that matters. It really is. It's the only test that matters. If I went through high school and college and my master's degree and I passed every test that was put in front of me and yet my son did not get to go to heaven because of my negative influence, I flunked the most important test God ever gave me. I've got to influence people for Christ. None of your stuff matters if people go to hell because you use it in an ungodly way. That's what matters. This life is the ultimate test because this test won't affect our lives for 30 years. It's going to affect our lives and lives around us forever, for eternity. That's why this test is so important. We have to work hard to understand how to have a right attitude because, guys, Money in and of itself is not a bad thing. It's not. There's nothing wrong with money. Go look at 1 Timothy 6.10. I was told this verse completely wrong. The verse actually says, For the love of money leads to all kinds of evil. Okay? I was taught that money leads to evil. That's the way I was taught. But that's not what the Bible says. It's a gross interpretation, misinterpretation, of God's word. God's word actually says the love of money. And so if you've got wealth, there's nothing wrong with that. If your love is wrapped around that wealth and your whole focus is on your wealth, that's when you're in trouble. That's when you've stepped too far and you've sinned. It's not the money that's bad. It's our attitude about money or resources. Guys, same thing with free time. Having free time, or having money, or having a car, or having a wonderful job, that uh, none of those things are bad. It's the attitude we have towards those things. If you say, well, I've got free time on Saturday morning, and Sunday afternoon, and on Friday afternoons, and no one's getting my free time. That's not yours. You can't dictate what you do with your free time if God calls you to use it for Him. It's our attitude towards those things that's important, that really matters. Because here's the reality. Jesus wants to bless you. Every single one of us in this room, Jesus wants to bless you. But here's the hard part. For many of us in this room, and I'm counting myself as part of it, for many of us in this room... He can't trust us with the little he's already given us. So he has a hard time blessing us more. So let me go back to the car illustration. Let's say I loaned you a car, okay? And I put one more stipulation on you borrowing my car. I looked at you and said, 
if you're going to borrow my car, I also want you to obey all the traffic laws. Now, that would probably disqualify me right off the bat from being able to borrow a car from someone, I'll be honest. But if I asked you to obey all the traffic laws, is that an unreasonable request? <laughs> we'll talk later, Vince. <laughs> No, it's not an unreasonable request for me to tell you I want you to obey the traffic laws. And, and let's say you borrow my car, you agree to the terms, and two days later, you fly past me on Highway 95 going 75 miles an hour. And then two days after that, I'm driving down Jamaica in front of the elementary school, and you swerve around me going 50 miles an hour in a school zone. And then three days after that, I'm sitting in my yard with my son playing ball, and we're playing and having a great time, and you come barreling around the corner in my car at unsafe speeds, and you put my life and the life of my son at risk because of your reckless driving in my vehicle. And then a week later, you come to me and you say, hey, Chad, can I borrow? <clears throat> I'm going to stop you right there. Because I can't even trust you with the first thing that you borrowed from me. Why would I let you borrow more? Guys, here's the hard part. For many of us in this room, including myself, we haven't been fully trustworthy in the little bit that God has given us. So why would God give us more? Now hear me clear on this. I'm not saying that if you were 100% trustworthy with everything God gave you, that all of a sudden God's going to drop a $91,000 check in your lap. It's not how it works. It doesn't mean, it doesn't equate to, well, if I'm trustworthy, God's going to give me money. That's not how God works because God blesses in tons of ways. Maybe he blesses you with a faith that can move mountains, a trust in him that gives you peace. Maybe he's going to trust you with physical health or mental maturity. Maybe he's going to bless you with many relationships that would support you during difficult times. Maybe he's going to invest and, and help you have a stronger marriage or great kids or I don't know. But God blesses in many, many ways. Financially is actually the least important on his list. Because again, what did I say earlier? The true riches our relationships, those people that we influence to come to know Jesus who will have eternity in heaven with us. So the fact is, is we have to learn what's important. Can you imagine in your life if all of a sudden, because you trusted God and leaned on how he manages and, and his instruction for you and managing his resources, imagine in your own life if he blessed you because he could trust you, and he blessed you with a faith and a peace that could get you through any difficult time. How valuable would that be? What if you're trustworthy and you're faithful to God and the resources he's given you, and suddenly he begins to bless your marriage, and you have a stronger, happier relationship with your spouse than you've ever had before, and suddenly your family and home life changes dramatically for the positive? Would that be something that would be valuable to you? Yeah, I hope so. If not, come talk to us. We've got counselors available. But the fact is, is that Christ wants to change our lives and bless us for the better. But sometimes that blessing is not about money. It's about changing our life for the best. Imagine Lake Havasu. If every person who stepped foot into this building over this weekend, okay, Every one of you in this room and everybody who's going to be here at 11 and everybody who came last night in the 8 o'clock service this morning, imagine if every person who stepped foot in this building suddenly looked at everything they had as if it was God's and not theirs and started managing God's resources the way the Bible describes. How do you think this town would change? Guys, this town would be completely different. Crime rate would drop. The fact is, is that people would love people better, that there wouldn't be as much fighting, there wouldn't be people arguing, because I guarantee you that if we did the like six levels of connection, the oh, you know him, and they know him, and they know her, if we did that connection through everybody who comes to this church on the weekends, every single one of us has connection with the thirty-five to 40,000 people that are outside of these doors. And we have the influence, we have the opportunity to change them for Christ, 
to introduce them to a life-changing relationship with Jesus, who then, his spirit, could come in and change their life in a dramatic way. So here's the final note for you. Knowing that this life is a test, what needs to change to pass? Knowing that this life is a test from God, what do you need to change in your life in order to pass the test? Will you use God's resources for Him, or will you use God's resources for your own personal pleasures and ignore what He desires for you? Join me in prayer.